in 1850 when um, a certain uh, Thomas Wicksteed, no relation to Wicksteed Park, um, he was a borough engineer for five out of the nine boroughs in London for sanitation. He was the first guy to use a steam pumping engine for transferring water from reservoir to reservoir. Um, he, uh, he also diverted rivers and prevented people getting cholera without even realising it at the time. But anyway, in 1850 he moved to Leicester. We don't know why, but he did. Um, and he built a small sewage works, roughly where Asda's car park is now. And he formed a company with a really catchy name called the Patent Solid Sewage Manure Company. Yeah, dot com. <laughs> but um, he worked there for about two years, um, the drawing out the, uh, the solid matter, uh, covering it with lime to make it kill the germs in it, and then selling it to the farmers for manure to put on the fields. Um, he'd done the same thing in London with success, but up here, whether the farmers were a bit poorer or, or the sewage was a different flavour, we don't know. But anyway, he moved on and, and left it for the corporation to run. They took it over. So what they did was a very innovative thing. They dug a big channel and let it run straight into the river saw um, without treating it at all. Now this caused Leicester's version of the big stink, uh, particularly as it flowed down past Belgrave Hall, which is where John Ellis lived. He was um, chairman of the Midland Railway Company. He was also a member of Parliament. And he complained bitterly in Parliament that um, Leicester's version of the big stink was happening. Um, and unusually for members of Parliament, they never listened to him. It's a bit strange, isn't it? At any rate, a bit, a bit sarcastic there. At any rate, um, Ellis died and his two daughters took the place over. But whether they shouted loud or it was girl power, we don't know. But they stood up and listened to her, uh, the women and plans were put in hand for this place to be built uh, about 1889. Um, they gave the neo-Gothic architect called Stockdale Harrison, he was responsible for the building. Um, the um, engines were actually built by Jimson's, they were a local company on Hawken Road, the building still stands today. Um, they were known for making brewing equipment, uh, steam engines, lift equipment, which is ultimately what they ended up doing. Um, they had 300 employees. They had a boiler shop, they had a, a foundry, and they even had their own railway side in running in so they could export all their wares all over the world. Um, the engines were installed first, um, yeah, which two of them? Those two there. Those two Those there. Two there. 1890 they were put in, uh, and then these two came later in 1891. Um, when installed, they were made to do a, a test on them. They wanted to run all four engines, night and day, to see how much sewage they could shift. So outside the coal yard out there, there's lots of coal and suede to put in so they knew how much coal it was going to use. And what is now the gallery was full of boilers in there. They steamed up the boilers and they got all four engines working and they pumped all the sewage and then they ran out of sewage. So some bright sparks said, let's open this valve here, let's the water in the canal into the sewage system. So they did that. Of course, the next day they flooded the city farms where it used to pump to, flooded them out. So they had to abandon the test they declared a success. Um, so then for pretty much from 1891, the engines were overhauled in 1905, and again in 1920 they were quite worn out. Um, the boilers were all replaced because they were life expired, but they thought they needed something more modern to pump the sewage. So just along the other side of the uh, engine house there is a building which you can go and have a cup of tea sometime when we have a steam day. That was the uh, electric switch room in there. And then the building beyond, there's three big electric pumps in there, massive things. Two of them were built by Tangies of Birmingham, the other one was built by the Worthington Simpson Company. At the time, they reckon it was the largest ram pump in Europe. And they more or less took over from the steam pumping engines to pump the sewage. But then, as the city was still growing, say, from 1891 to, to 1910, there's an extra 125 miles of sewage because the city was still growing. So by 1924, the city was quite massive and it was beginning not to cope again. So eventually they were running beam engines and the electric pumps right up to the 1960s when they abandoned the whole site and they made the sewage run up to Beaumont Lees where it's treated today. Um, so at that time, the engines were just going to be scrapped and that would be it. 
And then someone looked at them and thought how beautiful they were. Because it would be nice to say if there was a, a monument to Vesta's engineering. So yeah. they were just saved, they were repainted, they were just saved as a monument. Then the next stage in the story comes when the Vesta Street swimming baths closed and they bequeathed us their Cochrane boiler, which stands outside now, it's been decommissioned. And with that in place, they could now run a steam engine. But they've been all stood idle for so long, they were all seized up. So before us volunteers started, number three engine was repaired by a restoration company. I say that in broad letters because they did lots of damage to it. But they got number three engine running, non-condensing. Uh, at least they've got one engine that worked. But then as the, as the Leicester Museum's Technology Association started, we've got this one working. Then 20 years ago, number four engine. And then 10 years ago, number one engine. So they all actually work. It's the only place in the world you can see four working beam engines in one engine house. Uh, but we can't run all four together because we don't have enough steam. We've got a modern gas fired package boiler in the corner of the gallery now provide steam. Um, when we had the Cochrane boiler, because it wasn't computer controlled, you could do all sorts of things with it, and we managed to run one engine all day, two engines for half an hour, three engines for 13 minutes, and four engines for 11 seconds. <laughs> it took a lot of volunteers to, to, to work it, but that's what we did. Then, just tell me about the, uh, the round window up there. Uh, the round window over there, uh, which is the only round window in the building, uh, was originally going to be a clock. We, we've got some drawings from the 1890s, 1880s that show that as a clock. Because over, the, over that way was uh, Belgrave Hall where John Ellis lived. And he wanted his view because he could see it from there. Uh, so the front looks like a stately home. And the back of it is the industrial side that faced the city. So he, he wanted a nice view and he wanted a clock. But what they failed to recognise was that when they over at the ground, <laughs> move this way on these rails on the other side of the building, would, would take off the back of the clock. So they couldn't fit the clock, they just had to fit the window. So he didn't get what he wanted. Well, his daughters didn't get what they wanted. <coughs> Talking of the crane, the crane was the first thing to be installed in here. That lifted every part of these engines into position. So the crane's capable of lifting 16 tonnes. Well, these beams are 15 tonnes, they're 29 foot 6 inches long and they're made of two flitches of hard steel plate 2 inches thick. So upon the crane they must have had a really strong man to wind, wind these up. It must have yeah. taken three or four days to get them yeah. high. Yeah. We, we've actually used that crane lifting lesser weights than this, two, two and a half tonne. Uh, very it hard you. work. It does when you're an old man anyway. <laughs> The son who's driving the engine at the moment, we send him up there, he manages it all. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. But to wind the actual crane along, it's almost a day's job. But every part of this floor lifts out, and you can access any part of the building. These eyes, you put a rope around them and lift it up to the crane, move them out, uh, and you can access any part of the building for lifting heavy stuff. The crane itself, the rails it runs on, is X Great Western Railway Bridge Rail designed by Brunel himself. So we've got a little bit of Brunel in this engine house. Just by accident that one. So the oiling system, the lubrication system on the beam, it's all oiled with 220 bearing oil. And the, um, the oil have a, a wick which is made of worsted wool and it soaks the oil up and drips it down the tube in the centre. Now that's ideal when it's a pumping station because that bearing is getting oiled day and night and you don't need to keep your eye on it. But because it's now a museum and we might start the beam engine at dinner time and run till five o'clock at night, that oil will carry on dripping oil down to that bearing for probably the next three days. And it all ends up in the basement. You have been down the basement yet? Yeah? Yeah. Very oily down there, isn't it? Much to, you know, we keep trying to clean it up. But this this oil here, you've got a catchment pot on each side there a little cock on the bottom which you open the cock and you can drain the oil off into the bucket provided it's not all stuff full of dead flies you have to poke it out to the dead to run it but, um, there's about 70 oiling points on these engines it varies out who you ask do you ask yeah. but um, you're all, all up to count them if you want but we get about 70. 
we have to go around every one of them it's, you know, the day that we're going to run the engine to make sure they're all topped up with oil. Um, so if you'd like to make your way down to the next floor down, you've had your history lesson, I'll do your science lesson there. Okay folks, what you're looking at here is the tops of the cylinders of the engine. Um, it's known as a compound engine because you use the steam twice. And the name Jonathan Hornblower, 1832 comes into mind. He was an engine erector for the Harvey Company at Hale in Cornwall. Um, that's where all the pumpy engines were built down there for the tin mines. And that. Um, now he'd been messing around with um, an engine built by Richard Trevithick. Now Trevithick was the father of high pressure steam. Uh, James Watt thought he was absolutely abhorrent because he said that high pressure steam was dangerous. And in fact, um, Trevithick did have a few boiler explosions, but he put it down to operator error, so at the end of that. But anyway, um, Thornblower, when he was uh, repairing this engine of Trevithick, he noticed that the steam coming out the exhaust of the Trevithick engine was roughly the same pressure that went into a James Watt engine. So he thought if he could combine the two together, he could make a really powerful machine. But he tried, when he tried to patent it, James Watt jumped on him like a ton of bricks because he'd already patented the double acting steam engine that's doing pushes and pulls. So that was that. But then eight years later, um, Hornblower was working with a chap called Arthur yeah. Wolf and he discussed this patent business with him. He researched it and Watt's patent the lap by that time. So Arthur Wolf patented this type of engine. And that's why. That's 89 years later these engines were built and still known as a wolf compound steam engine. Now how it works is the steam came from the boilers that were behind this boiler in the gallery, there was eight of them, about 80 pounds of square inch. There isn't a high pressure cylinder over there, it's about 2.3 inches diameter, about 5.9 inches stroke, and the steam expanding would push the piston up or down and the spent steam from there would still be about 30 pounds of square inch so we've got a higher piston valve into the low pressure cylinder because the steam had expanded we needed a bigger vessel for it to go into so the steam was used again to push the piston up and down and then from there it was exhausted into the condenser you can see we've shown the condenser downstairs did they say what it was for uh, we're not <laughs> right, what happened was the steam would still have a lot of heat in it but no pressure so it would go into the condenser where a, a, a ring of water jets would spray it with water and of course it would turn it instantly into a vacuum so when the steam is pushing one side of the piston on here the vacuum is pulling the other side so you've got like a three stage drive on this engine, you know, condensing steam engine. The condenser, the separate condenser was invented by James Watt, uh, and that was the invention that did make him famous. Um, so that's how it worked. Um, you'll notice this um, geometry system up here, mobile geometry lesson, is what's known as the parallel motion. Again, it's a James Watt invention. Uh, when he developed the double acting steam engine, the, uh, the old system where they had a chain at the end of the piston rod around the end of the beam wouldn't work because you can't push a chain. So he developed the parallel motion in 1784. And um, what happens is if you, if you put the piston rod directly onto the end of the beam, it would describe an arc as it went up and down, so it would bend all the clock up and it wouldn't work. So all this does, it cancels out all the sideways movement by this fixed linkage here. It's a, it's a precise um, geometry, uh, trigonometry. trigonometry, to get it right. Um, when this engine was sent though, you'll notice that the low pressure piston rod waggles about a little bit. You didn't get the geometry quite right. I think the guy who assembled it got the DCM. You know what that means? I bet you know, so come on there. <laughs> now the lubrication on the cylinders is different than the rest of it. You have to use a, a different type of oil because when you mix it with steam, steam tends to make things deteriorate. So 
it's got a thick gloopy oil, it's got silly oil, it's thick in there. And it's the stuff that makes the steam engine smell so nice. And then the oil is pumped, the two little pumps inside that chamber. You can see the little stuff, you can see the globules of oil going up there. Well, that's on its way to the cylinder to reach off the pipe. And it sprays into the cylinders and it covers it with a really oily film and stops it all from seizing up. Before they were fitted in 1909, before they were fitted, we got the, uh, the type of lubricant in here, where a block of suet would be put inside there, straight from the butcher's shop. <laughs> the suet would heat up and melt, and it would oil the pistons. Not very well, but it needs to do it, you know. But this oil here, there's a type, a different type, you know, there's different oils all on these engines. And on the, um, the little A-frame B engine in the gallery, there's a, a magnificent example of it. known as a fat lazy lubricator. That's the technical name for it. Yeah, we didn't, we didn't make that at all. <laughs> yeah, the, um, the ornamentation in here, I really think it's particularly ornamental because we think the gin because it was a left of company, a reason building it, they used this place as a bit of a showroom. So anyone wanting to know what sort of quality engineering they were taking for, they'd stick them in all awesome the parts and bring them down here, show them round, and there'd be no, left with no doubt at all how good they are. And I think you know, you've probably noticed the flywheel which is going now. That's 21 tonnes and it's 21 foot in diameter. And that's to carry the momentum of the engine over to work all the valve through. You can theoretically, you can make a pumping engine without any rotated movement, just straight up and down. That's the engine rotation. And you notice the two portals going around over there. It's a, it's a James Watt patent that he did invent it. It's um, actually invented by Christian Voyager for controlling the compression on stones in, in windmills. He uses it for controlling the speed of the steam engine. As the, as the engine gets faster, the balls will come out and it will work this meter to shut the steam down. Now on a pumping engine like this, the load is always the same and the steam pressure coming into it is always the same, so really you don't need governors on it. But if the pipe is active, on its way up to Beaumont Lee, we've got 180, 180 feet high. 180 feet a mile and a half away, you know where Tesco is up there, where it's about 50 miles and you can just drive the city up there. And if you fight road on the way up there, it would be like you driving each other and suddenly you put your foot on the clutch, the engine would rev out of control. And that would happen to this and it would just destroy itself. So the governors, if you start going fast, the governors will swing out and you work this lever and you feel it shuts the steam down so the engine can't destroy itself. Um, the only thing I've not showed you is you see the glass floor up there, you've got um, prisms in the glass there. Well, when, when the sun shines, it reflects on those prisms, it shines on the brass plate there. So the brass plate is all on there when the plate's open. And then you've got the Lord there at the top, you've got the Ordinary, you've got all the councillors, you've got the architects, and then right at the bottom, like we always are, they've got the engineers. Everything in engineering is every set of pay packet, I think. <laughs> okay folks, you like to find your own ground and complete uh, the tour. deeper one in the minute considering the amount of rain we've had over the last few days but also we have our own little waterfall 
which this is the worst I've seen it in the last few years. That has been flowing almost constantly since the pumping station opened. That, that wall is about as thick as the tunnel, so again, 10, 12 feet thick, maybe a bit thicker, considering it's the outside wall and the weight it has to hold up. Also, above us, these are, this is the mountain here. So all of these openings will open and close the valves and tie everything perfectly. For six pence extra a week. A few of you might know what that felt like. So we we'll use this train system to take this front, this uh, front of the sewage pump, so they took this front off which weighed a ton, paid somebody six pence extra a week to drive into there and clean out anything disgusting that was in there. Look in there, used to be a person to drive in there and clean all that out. When the corporation left the, the pumping station and passed it to Leicester Museums, there was a, a note on here. Again, I never saw it because it was in the 70s before I was born. But And it said, please do not open this valve as you will flood the basement with very, very, very old, I'll call it excrement, but I believe they used the Anglo-Saxon term beginning with S.